The CDC is back. They got a new tweet. They got a new analysis in the MMWR, and they got a New York Times story. They got everything they want. Here's their tweet. New CDC report finds children and teens 18 years and younger who've had COVID-19 are 2.5 times more likely to have a diabetes diagnosis after infection. Prevent COVID-19 by using tools like masks and vaccines for those eligible. So that's their tweet. What was their paper? It's a very interesting paper in MMWR, and I took a deep look at it, and I'm going to show you right on the screen. I've written about it on my Substack already. It's entitled, Does COVID-19 Cause Diabetes in Kids? The CDC publishes an embarrassing study. This study has got a lot of problems with it. So what do they do in this study? Well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, imagine you have a child, and imagine that child goes by the whole year without getting COVID-19. That's what we would all want. In a perfect world, that's what we all want. What's that child's risk of diabetes? Now imagine the same child is afflicted with, with COVID-19. What's that child's risk of diabetes? And that's what they're trying to answer in this study. And they use two data sets. They use IQVIA and they use Health Verity. And these are two insurance data sets. And for each of these, they pull out billing codes. So they say, who under the age of 18 over the course of the pandemic has had a SARS-CoV-2 diagnosis, a COVID-19 diagnosis? And who are all the kids that don't have that diagnosis? And then for every kid with the diagnosis in IQVIA, they match them based on age and sex. And for every kid in health verity, they do the same thing. They also get a third cohort in the IQVIA, and those are people who in years past, in yesteryear, they suffered from a different respiratory virus. And then they go forward and they say, so here are the kids with COVID-19, here are the kids without COVID-19, two different data sets. And in one data set, here are the kids who had a different respiratory virus. What is their risk of a diabetes diagnosis within 30 days after they're coded as having a COVID diagnosis? And here's the answer. If you had a COVID-19 diagnosis in the first data set, a whopping 68 out of 80,000 people or 0.08%, that isn't that isn't 8%. That isn't 0.8%. It's not even close to 1%. It's 0.08% ended up with diabetes. Among kids without COVID-19, that percentage was 132 out of 400,000 plus 0.03. So we're talking about 0.05%, a very small number. Among those in yesteryear who had a different respiratory virus, it was 0.06. So that's a difference of 0.02, SARS-CoV-2 compared to other respiratory viruses in the past. Then they replicated this analysis in a different data set. Here they do something different. They don't just look at billing codes. They also see if somebody tested for COVID-19 and put you in one group if you tested positive and the other group if you tested negative. This is the Health Verity database. And they conclude 0.08 compared to whatever, 0.03 is 2.5 times as much. So you're 2.5 times more likely to come down with diabetes. What do I think about this? I think it's a problematic paper, obviously, because... As I told you at the outset, the goal of the analysis is to get a group of kids who had COVID-19 and a group of kids who in other respects are the same. They're just the same age, the same sex. They control for those too, but they have to be the same socioeconomic status, the same racial makeup, the same BMI, and all the other risk factors that go into getting diabetes. And if you compare these two groups of people, what's the difference in diabetes after COVID-19? What does COVID-19 do to your risk of diabetes? But they don't do that. They're not adjusting for race. They're not adjusting for socioeconomics. They're not adjusting for BMI. And those things are important determinants of both getting SARS-CoV-2, which may affect the most marginalized people in society and even slightly more overweight kids than, than normal weight kids. And also diabetes. Those factors also play into diabetes. They may also be more likely to become diabetic. And they're not adjusting for those values. So you're not finding the independent contribution of COVID-19. You're also learning about what might be the underlying risk factors that lead one to both COVID-19 and diabetes. I don't know why they don't correct for that. I really puzzled. Surely they have somebody's BMI. They could at least do that. Second, the second problem with this I talk about in my Substack is they don't have the true denominator. Because of all the kids in America who had COVID-19, how many have a billing code attached to them in an insurance data set that said that they had COVID? And the answer is, even in the group of people covered by this policy, there's got to be many kids who had a little bit of a runny nose one day. They thought nothing of it. They never got tested. Some kids who felt a little bit sick and the parents said, eh, let's see if they feel better in the morning. They never got tested. They don't have the real denominator. So in the group of people so sick that they sought medical care and were diagnosed with COVID-19, the rate of diabetes within 30 days is 0.08%. So eight one hundredths of 1%. What about if you had the real denominator of all the people who didn't even go get tested? It's going to be much, much lower than that. 
So this is not the thing you need to worry about in life. If you're going to get COVID-19, there are other things to worry about, like being really sick with COVID. That's what you should worry about. You don't have to worry about getting diabetes down the road. The risks are really, really low. They're not giving you the real denominator, which will make the risks probably an order of magnitude or more lower. Next problem. Do they correct for ascertainment? So when somebody is sick and they meet the medical system, the medical system, we don't let go of people like that. We see them for follow-up over and over again. Make sure they're doing better on the mend. And in doing so, we order more tests. We get more chemistries. We check the sugar again and again and again. And we're going to find more diabetes the more we look. And so maybe those kids who are otherwise the same that we don't really have, but imagine the otherwise the same kids, if you screen them with as many blood tests as somebody who had a COVID diagnosis and recovered, you might find the same level of diabetes. Who knows? You might find something else entirely. The last point, the health verity thing. The health verity thing really killed me because they're including in the control arm people who tested for COVID who tested negative. These people might be even more dissimilar than sort of the other cohorts. For instance, imagine you were a parent wanting to go on a trip to Hawaii and you know they have that pesky policy of having to test negative and you look at all the, the booked sites and they're all booked up solid and you know it's a rush on all those testing sites. So you just squeeze a visit in the doctor's office, get this kid tested, get a negative test and so we can go to Hawaii. You're going to be put in the didn't have COVID group. But that person might be very different than potentially the kid whose parents are essential workers, who are working the night shift, who is in a multi-generational household, and that kid might develop COVID-19. And you're comparing these two kids to see who has a different rate of diabetes. But of course, one is a very socioeconomic advantage kid and one is a very disadvantaged kid. So that might even exacerbate that problem. And then the absolute risks really baffle me here because the analysis by the CDC shows that the rate of hospitalization was about seven-tenths of 1% if you have COVID-19. Um, that's an order of magnitude more frequent than diabetes. So if you wanted to give somebody something to worry about in a kid diagnosed with COVID-19 by a billing code, it would be going to the hospital because that's about 10 times more common than developing diabetes in the next 30 days. You don't need anything else to worry about. You already got something to worry about. The fact that it's seven tenths of 1% and it also suggests that the denominator is not the true denominator of all the kids who had the infection because that would be subsequently lower. And you can go back and pull the paper from Germany to see, you know, what is the rate of hospitalization in a healthy kid. So when you put all this together, what am I to think? What am I to think? Uh, you pair this with the New York Times coverage and the New York Times coverage just puppets literally what the CDC says. It just amplifies what the CDC says. There's not an ounce of criticism there. Are we incapable of accurately criticizing scientific papers when they appear in MMWR, which by the way, is not known for the highest standards of excellence. As Marty Macri likes to say, some of the papers won't even pass a seventh grade science fair. This paper I put in that bucket, I really don't know at all. I mean, I don't know if COVID-19 causes more diabetes than not having COVID-19. If you take the same people who had it and who otherwise didn't have it, but could have had it, they're indistinguishable from these people based on all the covariates. I have no idea. I have no idea. And this paper doesn't help clarify that at all. Of course, the CDC uses this paper as another reason to say, you know, this is a reason to get vaccinated. But I don't think that this diabetes point is really going to tip the scale in anyone's mind. Um, there's already the hospitalization point. They could have emphasized that. It's 10 times more common. And also, it, it's not really relevant because what is the relative benefit of vaccines? That's been discussed heavily at their own Verback and AHIP meetings. They don't need this piece of scholarship to make the case. In fact, this paper doesn't have a group of people who are vaccinated and not vaccinated to show the impact of the vaccine. It's something else entirely. It's the risk of diabetes after COVID-19. So I don't understand why they're doing this. I don't understand why the paper is this way. I don't understand why the tweet is so sensational. I certainly don't understand why anyone would take this result at face value. I think it's probably almost certainly not true. It's probably exaggerated. It probably reflects the bias that the unfortunate kids who developed COVID-19, particularly in the first and second wave of the pandemic, are kids who are marginalized, perhaps more overweight of different racial and socioeconomic categories, they're more likely to develop diabetes than the counterparts who didn't develop COVID-19, whose parents could use their wealth to shield them from COVID-19 in those first two waves, um, and even into the third wave. Um, they're fundamentally different kids. And uh, when you take these kids and you keep doing blood tests on them in recovery, you're going to find eight one hundredths of one percent diabetes. Um, what would it have been if they didn't have COVID nineteen? I have no idea. Would it have been higher, lower, the same? I have no idea. Um, is the diabetes the thing I worry the most about? No, I worried about the fact that they were ten times more likely to be hospitalized. So I don't know why we're talking about the diabetes. So this is a terrible paper. It's not a causal paper. It wouldn't pass muster in most journals, and it didn't. Um, that's why it's not there. It's getting undue attention. It fulfills a part of the narrative. 
um, but it is not really rigorous science. And so we have to be careful um, in an effort to get people to make the choices we want them to make. Um, we can't uh, pervert and uh, sacrifice what science is. And I worry that this is the kind of scholarship, if you would call it that, that does such a thing. So those are just my thoughts. And if you want to know more of my thoughts, you should subscribe to my Substack. That's where I give most of my thoughts. And if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message. This is the peer review of this publication. Were it to come on my desk, I would have ripped it apart. I peer review a lot of articles. I didn't peer review this article, but now I have. So until next time.